All right, welcome to Quick Media's Come Follow Me series. We are covering Exodus chapters 6 through 13. We are following up here with Moses, who has been on Mount Horeb, or Sinai, and been given the name of the Lord and been given the authority of the Lord through his calling. And of course, he received the Melchizedek priesthood from Jethro. And now we're going to see the follow through of these three things, the priesthood, the authority, or in other words, whose name are you coming through? And then and then the name that is attached to that. And we're going to see how that's utilized. And, 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 and he says, remember to Moses, the Lord says to Moses that, he gives him his name. He he tells him that he's going to to use the rod that's in his hand, right? And a rod is used for priests and for kings even, as a, as a a an emblem of authority. And he, that rod is turned into a serpent by Jehovah by the Lord. So he's using the the staff, the the rod, in the name of the Lord to use as something that is going to bring signs and miracles in the name of Jehovah, and it becomes a serpent. So those are some things to, to hold on to from the last episode. And then we're going to see follow through here with that same theme as we go through these, these chapters here. Now, these chapters are full of all of the miracles, right? The 10 miracles or plagues that, that, uh, that, that, Egypt experiences and that the Israelites do not everything everything in a sense is a Passover right it's it's not just the firstborn that we get at the end everything is a Passover right all all of these plagues plague the Egyptians and not the Israelites so Passover in some ways is a little bit broader right than, than just the last plague that hits Egypt now, of course, that's the focus of all of this, and and that's the focus, as we'll see, is on Jesus Christ. But really, the Passover is also everything that is that is happening here in the name of Jehovah. It is a way of showing the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant to the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph and Ephraim, in a sense, right? So... This is, um, I, I'm not going to go through the plagues much is what I'm saying in this. Uh, there are some interesting things in there, but this episode is going to focus on some things before that. And then just especially on the last plague with the firstborn son uh, that is killed of each of the Egyptians and, and that is saved or passed over with the Hebrews, with the Israelites. So chapter 6, let's uh, or chapter 7, it's 7 through 13, not, not 6 through 13. So let's get to chapter 7 here. So looking at the summary in this chapter, we have Moses is appointed to give the word of the Lord to Pharaoh. The Lord will multiply signs and wonders in Egypt. Okay, again, what is the scenario here? It's, it's those that are following the covenant under the authority of God, the priesthood, and those that are not. That's the change here. It's not just the good guys and the bad guys, right? This is about priesthood and covenant. Aaron's rod becomes a serpent. The river is turned into blood. The magicians imitate the miracles of Moses and Aaron. So I'm I'm going to go through what those magicians do a little bit as we go through, through uh, through these plagues. Because though I'm not going to really touch on the plagues, I want you to I want to show you what is being shown here through this example of all of these plagues with with the Egyptians and the Hebrews. So verse one, and the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. So we can move those up the fluid hierarchy, those those names a little bit more, and say that that he is basically Moses is a as a is a uh, prophet to Pharaoh, so to speak. And Aaron is a spokesperson for Moses. It's kind of nice to see that. In, in, in many cases, we only have an example of, especially in the, in the Old Testament, of just the prophet sitting by himself. In this case, we have Moses going with Aaron to support him. And verse 2, Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, 
that he send the children of Israel out of this land. So this is going to be the theme over and over again. They're going to go to Pharaoh, who is the authority of the world, so to speak, the world of Egypt. And, they're, and, and, and the, the, the authority of the world, the culture of the world, the power of the world is not going to let the people go. And so verse 3, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Of course, that is Pharaoh will harden his own heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. So this to me is if you look at the world that we live in and, and you're trying to go along with the priesthood, you're trying to go along with a prophet, you're trying to go along with the covenant path, the world is going to harden its heart toward you in many cases. That is a natural thing. And Egypt here would be the world. And they're going to have imitations that are hollow, that are void of, of real sincerity, that are void of true love in many cases, and of course that are void of the doctrine of Christ. And so as the Lord gives this authority to Moses, and, and Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go, you have the Pharaoh that is you know, represent, let's just represent it, though, re- representing the world, the world is going to try and hang on with all the power and authority that it's been able to build under a different type of, of development of that power, right? This is not a development of righteous power. This is a development of worldly power, of tyranny, the very, the very opposite of what, what the Lord does in reigning over his own people who want to be his subject, so to speak. And he says right here again, and here we go right back to our subject from last week in verse four, but Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you. Oh, so why are we doing this in the first place then? Right? Why, why, again, this applies so much to each of us. He's commanding Moses to go to Pharaoh and, and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. But then he tells Moses, oh, by the way, he's, he's not going to let you go. So the natural, you know, uh, uh, response might be, oh, well, then why am I doing this? Right? What's the point? Right? But, but again, or, or you know what, Lord, why don't we just go to the last plague first? And, and maybe that will have Pharaoh allow our people to go, right? Just, let's just have the firstborn son of each of the Egyptians die first and then and then maybe he'll let our people go, but that's not the process. It has to build all the way up through that. It's, 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 look, I'm going to let things happen. And in fact, I'm going to instigate things as the Lord. And, and there is going to be adversity. There's going to be calamity. There's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. As I try to allow the world to change, And I try to allow my people to be let go. But that's not what happens. We see the same example in in the Book of Mormon with with Alma and his people as they are enslaved by the Lamanites and and, um, the Amulonites and, and, and those that have power over them, that treat them as slaves and and make things very difficult for them. And the Lord says for a while, well, this is the way it's gonna be. I'm going to try both peoples. I'm going to try my people, and I'm going to try those that have not chosen yet to be my people in this same circumstance. But then he allows them to go. And it's the same thing that's going to happen here with Egypt. So Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh, and the Lord says to Moses, look, in verse 9, when Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, shew a miracle for you, Then thou shalt say unto Aaron, take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. Okay, so this is the first thing they're doing. Why? What is happening here? Let's keep going here in verse 10. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. This is exactly the fulfillment of what the Lord showed Moses on the top of the mountain. Right here's my power. Here is my name, Moses. Here is the the rod in your hand. That is representative of my authority of my priesthood, and it is a serpent. It will become a serpent. And then down in verse eleven, then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, right? The magicians of Egypt are the priests of Egypt. 
right? They are the priests. These are not magicians that are trying to do a sleight of hand, although that might be true, I suppose. But they're not magicians the way we think of magicians. They are priests. And if you look at magicians and you shorten that word to the first four letters, you get M-A-G-I, the magi, right? The magi are the ones that visited Christ, right? They visited Jesus as a toddler, That would be, in most of those ancient cultures, that would be representative of priests that were there. And, of course, we have the term wise men in here also. Those would be the wise men, perhaps priests of the court of Pharaoh. So now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. Enchantments is a a Latin term, right? It gets in, in cantar. It's to chant or to sing or to speak, perhaps, um, these um, spells, if you will, if we we went to the magic side of this. So verse 12, for they cast down every man his rod and they became serpents. Hmm. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. All right. So what is happening here? We've talked about this already. We go all the way back to Abraham and Pharaoh. And what we get with Abraham, where he is sitting on the throne, in fact, simile number three of the book of Abraham, is that that he is talking to the Egyptians about about astrology or astronomy, the cosmos. Or really what it is to me is the temple. He's talking about the temple. He's talking about the doctrine of Christ. He's talking about priesthood and hierarchy. And why is he doing this? Because it's a representation of the true priesthood as compared to the imitation priesthood that the Egyptians have. That's what that is. That's the beginning of that. We learn in the book of Abraham that the Egyptians were cursed with not having the priesthood. And here comes Abraham in. And what is he doing here? That whole story is about Abraham having the priesthood and bringing in the proper and true priesthood. And then we can go back to Joseph. And Joseph comes out of the prison, and the magi or the sorcerers or the wise men of the court of of Pharaoh cannot interpret his dreams. But Joseph, who has the true priesthood, who is the true heir, comes in, and he is able to to interpret the dreams. And what happens with him? Well, in essence, like facsimile three with his great-grandfather, Abraham, Joseph sits on the throne of Pharaoh, and he runs Egypt. This is the next version of that. This is, this is 3.0, if you will, of Jehovah's priesthood versus the imitation priesthood. And as we learned on top of the mountaintop, that rod, it represents the priesthood and the name of Jehovah. And so when it's cast down with that serpent, and then the magi or priests of Pharaoh cast down their rods, they become serpents. The serpent of the rod of Aaron, of Moses, consumes the other, the other, uh, the other serpents. What is that showing us? What what is the point of this? Oh, God's great and he can do great miracles. Okay, something to that effect. But overall, in a much grander scale, it's about the priesthood. And it's it's the next kind of duel between these two sides. So here we go. This happens. And then down in verse 14, as we're going to get over and over again, And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuseth to let the people go. Now in verse 15, he says, In the morning take the rod which was turned to a serpent, and thou shalt take it in thine hand. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee. Again, this is about the name. This is about the authority. This is about the priesthood. Saying, Let my people go, or let them go out from the world that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Now, one thing that's interesting here is that the real reasoning, there's a little bit of trickery involved with this again. And it's, and it's 
the plan of the Lord here, actually. And so it's kind of kind of interesting the way this is written, similar to what we've had all the way going back to Abraham. Um, remember, there's there's trickery in a sense with Abraham and Sarah right from the beginning going into Egypt and having to do with the Abrahamic covenant. And here you have what what the children of Israel, if you really read this text, what they're really asking for here, Moses and Aaron, is that the Pharaoh will allow the children of Israel to go out three days away from Egypt into the wilderness and have a festival and sacrifices to Jehovah. And Pharaoh says, no, I'm not going to let you do that. That's what they're really asking. There's nothing in here that I see, and, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but I, I don't see anything in here that's talking about, hey, let all of us get out of here for good forever. And I think you'll see that in the text as we follow through on this. So then we get to verse 17. The Lord says, Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. So again, each time we get the rod in here, it's very important that we see that, but we have to tie that all the way back to that experience of Moses on top of the mountain where he throws it down and it becomes a serpent. It's the authority. And we get the fulfillment of this in verse 20. And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded. And he lifted up the rod and smote the waters. Right? It's just, it's over and over again. Emphasis. That were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of the serpents. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. Now, verse 22, this is important because they continue to go through the contrast of the authority here. Verse 22. And the magicians or priests of Egypt did so with their enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, right? So they, what is really said in here is that the, the, the uh, priests of Egypt try to stop it. They're trying to push it back, and they can't. Which authority has the power? Is it, again, think about our own circumstances here, regardless of where we live in the world, uh, even if things are really, really easy for you. Uh, they're never really, really easy for anybody. But here you have uh, a, a cry from the prophet of the, Lord, of the Lord to let his people go to the world, right? to let his people go, stop with the tyranny, stop with the oppression, stop with the temptations and the shackling through temptation and sin. That's the primary message. Stop with the shackling of temptation and sin with my people and let them go. But the world is not going to listen. It will harden its heart. All right, and then we get the, the separate acts with each of the plagues. It's the same act over and over again, right? The, the waters are turned to blood. The Pharaoh says, okay, I'll let your people go. Just get rid of the, all of the blood in the water everywhere. Moses goes back to the Lord, right, back through the hierarchy, goes back to the Lord, asks him to uh, relieve the problems and the plague for Pharaoh and the people because he said that they would let them go. He does, and Moses and Aaron go back to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh hardens his heart again and says, no, you're not going. And then it happens over and over again. And in every case... In every one of the plagues, the Magi try to push it back, and they can't. A battle of the true priesthood and the imitation priesthood. It gives us an example of, of following a prophet in the world. The rod that the prophet carries is the authority of God. It's the mantle of the priesthood. Another example here of the three days out in the wilderness in verse 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron, said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me. This is the next plague. And from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. Right? He's not saying that they may be free forever. I'm going to let them go that they can do sacrifice unto the Lord. So in a lot of the ways here, we are also talking about an issue of Something that's very, very much a topic for the brethren is the, the issue of freedom of religion. The Pharaoh will not give them the freedom to worship as they choose. 
And again, we get the same thing next after the frogs with the lice in verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, say unto Aaron, stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land that it may become lice. Right, so again, over and over again, we get that example. And then we get a little bit more here. Pharaoh is willing a little bit to give up something. He says, look, you can worship, but just do it in your own land. You can't leave for th- you know, three days out into the wilderness you know, to, to go worship. So he says, so Pharaoh calls in Moses and Aaron and says, go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. In other words, in Goshen, where you already are, where you were settled. But then Moses responds and says, it's not meet to so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes? And will they not stone us? So you've got a problem between the two religions. The, the, for, for the Israelites, this is not pure. This is not something that's going to work real well. And of course, for the Egyptians, they're not going to allow this in their own land. The individuals there, I mean, think about this. There's, you have very very zealous religious members, right? We, we oftentimes look back in history at these ancient civilizations and, and we think about this, just this evil paganism kind of, and, um, you know, fine, but there's still, there, there's still some, some sense of morality in these things, right? There's a sense of morality. They have their own commandments. They have a final judgment of being a good person, uh, where they, like we talked about perhaps before, the the the, the balance of, of your heart in, in the judgment versus the feather of Maat, that's got to have an equilibrium there uh, for you to be justified in, in Egypt, in the uh, afterlife. So these are these are religious people for the most part. They're religious people and they have a certain religion and they're going to act uh, in a certain way, if things aren't pure based on their laws, uh, based on their religious laws in their own land. So again, Moses says, look, that's not going to work. In verse 27, we will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And of course, that three days is a very common thing with the Israelites and other ancient, I believe other ancient civilizations. Think about Lehi, right? Again, He had to travel three days out of the land of Jerusalem in the wilderness before he arrives at the Valley of Lemuel, and there he makes a sacrifice. That's in the law of Moses. If you're within the three days of the temple, you're supposed to do the sacrifice at the temple. And then again in 28, what is is the deal? What is the bargain here that that Moses and Aaron really are trying to, to, to strike here? It's not that... Pharaoh's never going to let them go. The world is never going to let you go. The world will never let you go. It, 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 the, the, the force on this has to be purely miraculous and from the Lord for something like that to happen. Verse 28, and Pharaoh said, I will let you go. For what? That ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only ye shall not go very far away. I don't want you to go a full three days away. That's what the bargain is ha- that's happening here. Skipping through this and going to chapter 9, verse 4, we get the same thing, kind of this Passover that happens with each of the plagues. It says, And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. That's another one of the plagues, right? So there, it's a Passover with each of the plagues. Now, in verse 3 of chapter 10, we get what's at the crux of the world to, to a certain degree and, and why they want to hold on, right? There, there's, there's a major ingredient here that we always see. Right? Pharaoh is sitting on the throne in, to some degree of the great and spacious building. Verse 3, And Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. So, so humility is the key there, right? Again, the dream of Lehi is the great and spacious building on one side that is pride and the doctrine of Christ, which is on the other side, the tree of life, the condescension, the humility, lowering yourself below all through acts of love. 
and, and humility. The other question, though, is put yourself in Pharaoh's shoes here. How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? How many times do we get that sense from the Lord? Hopefully, actually often, to some degree. At least we're thinking about it. Because, you know, I know that this is something that I I have struggled with oftentimes. I, I know that with certain issues, I do not humble myself enough. And I need to do that. And... And, and I need to be more humble on certain issues. It's not that I'm, I think, trying to be arrogant about anything, but I'm not breaking down my heart enough, right? I'm not breaking down my heart enough to condescend more under the Lord to say, thy will be done. I don't have to do this my way. I will do it your way. And I think all of us go through that, right? It's, it's breaking down our hearts, the, the fleshy tablets of our heart as compared to what we're going to get here with the stony tablets from Moses, which is different, and, and, and throwing off the natural man. All right, so we get this here again about the going out for three days or leaving to, to worship. That's all that's on the table that I can see. It's not... Moses and Aaron out there saying, let my people go forever and stop enslaving them. That might be what they plan on, the, Mo- the, the Israelites, what Moses plans on, and that they're just going to leave. But here you see in, in verse 8, Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh. This is chapter 10. And he said unto them, go serve the Lord your God. So finally, after all these plagues, he's like, go ahead. Many of these plagues. Go serve your God, but who are they that shall go? Who's going to go to do these sacrifices and have this festival? Is is it just a a number of your men? Is it your elders? I want to know who's going, he's saying. And in verse 9, Moses responds and says, We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds. We will go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. He's saying, no, everybody's going. Understand, and all of our flocks are going to be leaving as well. Then we finally get to to chapter 11 and the last plague, which is the plague of the firstborn. And Moses says, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the beasts. So every, everyone that is the firstborn within uh, uh, Egypt is, is going to die. And so Moses warns Pharaoh. If Moses says, no, I'm not going to let your people go. And so in verse 10, And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, for the world and the lord hardened pharaoh's heart or rather pharaoh hardened his heart or the world just hardened its heart think about the destruction of the nephites think about the destruction of the jaredites as these calamities and this adversity and this conflict and chaos and suffering and death all started coming in you have two ways to go you can humble your heart or you can harden it and make it worse. And of course, we know the decisions, as a group anyway, overall, that the Nephites and the Jaredites made. So then over in chapter 12, verse 3, the Lord is speaking with Moses, and he says to him, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month shall they take, shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. It is, again, kind of interesting that lamb in Aramaic means servant also. It's the same Aramaic word. It's very closely related. Aramaic is a Semitic language, and it's what Jesus spoke during his life, and and mostly what the Jews would have probably spoken of in that time. In verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, 
You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. So it can be a lamb or it can be a goat. And you're going to keep it until the 14th day. And then you kill it in the evening. And then you're going to take the blood and strike it on the two side posts of your home and on the upper door post of the home. And in that home, you shall eat it. So you're going to consume it. I think this is kind of interesting when you think about this because the lamb obviously represents Christ. So the Passover festival that seems to become a much bigger deal actually later on than what it was at first with the Israelites, with the Jews. But what happens with that, Then they're, they're, that festival for the Passover is celebrating Christ's uh, um, intervention, right? His intervention from in, in, in the sacrificial atonement and in his death and, and to a certain degree resurrection, right? So that's what the lamb is. That's what it is, you know, as we're told, it's, he's the Paschal lamb. And so the blood of Christ, the blood of Jesus is represented by the lamb's blood on the outside of the house. And then on the inside, they're consuming, they're eating the lamb. They're eating lamb meat. And that's, that's a little bit of a, uh, you can look at that kind of like the sacrament, where you have the bread representing Jesus' body. That's the lamb meat in the house. And then you have the blood of Christ on the doorposts which would represent the water or wine, right? The blood of Christ. It's, it's, it's taking Christ into our homes and into our hearts when we, when we do the sacrament every Sunday. And then in 11, and thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, right? You're prepared, you're ready to roll. Your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat in the haste, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So, I, I, you know, a, lot of, a good way to look at that is that we are always prepared when we're leaning on the Savior and his sacrifice. If we lean on him, if we lean on the sacrifice, on the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, then, then we can be prepared. And we should do it in haste. Do not procrastinate the day of your repentance. Get out of Egypt as soon as you possibly can. Get out of the world as soon as you can. And in verse 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And in verse 11, And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So, again, it's, it's your, it, the sacrament is a remembrance to our covenant of taking on the name of Jesus Christ. Again, this is all done through the authority of the priesthood. And having your loins girded means that you are prepared, your shoes on and your staff in your hand. You are prepared. So if we, are, if we lean on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, then we can be prepared. And, and it says to eat it in haste. Well, it's the same. We don't want to procrastinate the day of our repentance. And then it says here in verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment I am the Lord. Again, if we look at this and say, okay, well, this is the world. What is really going to happen here? If you rely on the Savior, Jesus Christ, on the doctrine of Christ, if you have faith in him and you follow the priesthood and you are committed in your covenant path and you are prepared, then you can be pulled out of Egypt. You can be pulled out of the world. But those eventually of the world that are the firstborns, but those that are the firstborn of Egypt, those that are the firstborn of the world, that are the movers and shakers of, of sin, temptation, tyranny, and those things that would pull us away from the doctrine of Christ, well, those are the gods and the firstborns. Those things that are idols that can be broken but that are so often looked up to in the world as everything. 
In verse 13, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So, again, we can look at this in, in a physical sense, and there's probably some truth to that in our own world, in our own lives. But really, this is uh, we should look at this spiritually. That's what the intent of this scripture is. If we are relying on the blood of Christ, then the Lord will pass over us at judgment. That, that's, that's how I would look at that. Okay, and then and down in verse 29, here is when it happens. The, and it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as ye have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And so, verse 34, and the people took their dough before it was leavened, right? So we get the unleavened bread, so you got to get out now. Be in haste, be urgent in relying on the Savior. And then verse 37, and the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. So this is the men only. So when you add the women here and the children, if this number is correct, then you've probably you've got anywhere you know, you've probably got 1.52 million people, is what that is saying there. If that's an actual number, that's a pretty large group. Even a fraction of that is an incredibly large group to try and maintain as nomads in the desert. Verse 38, and a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. This is probably some additional Semitic tribes. And down in 46, in one house shall it be eaten. This was a festival of ritual about the Savior that you had in your home with your family. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. Okay, a foreshadowing of, of the Savior's death. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. So here's something interesting. So this is all of the congregation, all of the people of God. Those that are tied to the covenant path shall keep this. Now, bear with me on this. Verse 48, and when a stranger shall sojourn with you, with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, the feast, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he, remember, that has to do with baptism, covenant. And he shall be as one, he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So someone who's, we, we, in a, some degree, we follow this in terms of, okay, if you're not a member of the church, you don't partake of a particular sacrament. And, and, and so there, there are arguments today that, that, that allow that seem to allow for people to think, well, we need to be more open. And, and in certain things, that's probably true, but not when it comes to the commandments of the Lord, not when it comes to the covenants. And so to tolerate everything, right? Now you have an issue. We want to bring everybody to church. We want to show love, put our arms around them. It doesn't matter how they're dressed. It doesn't matter what their background is. It doesn't matter their culture. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't matter if they, if they follow the word of wisdom or not. It, it doesn't matter. Bring them to church. That's what we should be doing, right? It's a hospital for our spirits. And we should invite that more. It's not a club. However, eventually, for certain things to move forward to a certain degree through the covenants, we require, the Lord requires that there is humility, like we've been talking about with Pharaoh. 
to and 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 an assimilation that's going to be more and more an important word because today in the u.s especially and more and more in the west you have this idea that everybody can be their own selves and the highest value is to express your own self instead of to tie yourself to the commandments and to the to a zion people based on an assimilation to the law an assimilation to the doctrine of christ to being his people to commit and covenant to be his people. And that's where we're starting to run into more and more problems. It, it's, it, it moves from let's bring everybody in, which we must do to the church, to well, let's tolerate everything. And why shouldn't they be able to go to the temple? Why shouldn't they be able to, you know, X, Y, Z? Well, that's not really our choice. That's not an individual's choice. That is the Lord's choice. And, and, and he's asking for an assimilation to these things. Those people that agree to that assimilation are one in the land, as we're told right here. And here in verse 49, one law shall be to him that is homeborn, to the covenant people, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. All right? So, so we, again, a good example of that is the sacrament, but we can go well beyond that. There's one law that we all assimilate to. It's like the same type of thing that we try to do with the Constitution that many are trying to bring down now, the Constitution of the United States. One of the great inspired tenets of the Constitution is a universal law for everyone. The problem isn't that there's a universal law for everyone. The problem comes when it is applied differently to different groups of people. And that's where we get an issue. That's what's wrong. But one law, one God, one baptism, so to speak, as we hear in the New Testament, that's, that's what we are to assimilate to. That's what creates Zion. And then over in chapter 13, the concluding chapter here, of course we get a reference with all of this back to the land of promise, exaltation. Verse 5, And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, the promised land, and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy fathers, that's the oath of the oath and the covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. So there's our Abrahamic covenant reference. So as the Exodus proceeds, one of the things they take with them in verse 19, as he had asked and made them promise to do, is the, are the bones of Joseph. And Moses took the bones of Joseph, actually an embalmed mummy, and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. That's really interesting. Again, we want to follow Joseph through all of these things, even as a dead man here, and understand the heritage, the legacy, the place that Joseph has among the Israelites because it's going to tell a story about Joseph, or about the Manassehites and the Ephraimites that leave Jerusalem with Lehi. Very strong heritage that comes through there That is that ties us as Latter-day Saints back in through the Book of Mormon and then back up here through the Israelites. And Joseph is, you know, outside of looking at Christ as the Davidic king through Judah, Joseph is, is something we really want to follow because of the importance of those tribes or those that are assigned to those tribes in the last days, Manasseh and Ephraim. I'll talk to you next time.